Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, a full-length report on the Adams Next Door Symposium on the St. Louis Nuclear Nightmare, World War II-era highly radioactive nuclear weapons manufacturing waste illegally buried in a floodplain of the Missouri River. It has been invisibly poisoning residents for over 40 years, resulting in cancer clusters, brain tumors in children, autoimmune diseases, and much more. St. Louis Community College in Wildwood sponsored the event. Dr. Helen Caldicott flew in from Australia to be the keynote speaker. Bob Alvarez, nuclear workers advocate Denise Brock, and revered Missouri environmentalist Kay Dry addressed an overflow audience of more than 300 people, as well as live stream viewers from around the world, including nuclear hot seat listeners from Wales, Ireland, France, and New Zealand. Because Adams Next Door was live-streamed, it's available online, and we will have a link to it posted on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 244. Instead of duplicating what is already available online, this is meant to provide a less formal view of the events and the people drawn together by this nuclear nightmare. Audio snapshots of conversations with our genuine experts, the affected families, attendees, activists, those living near Westlake Landfill and Coldwater Creek, as well as their supportive friends. You'll hear excerpts from our van tour of the radioactive hot spots, St. Sin Park, Laddie Avenue, the airport site, Bridgeton, and Westlake. And you'll hear one woman's moving, uncensored account of what it means to be a lifelong non-smoker, suddenly diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer, because you lived in the wrong neighborhood. Today is Tuesday, February 23rd, 2016, and this is the story of the Adams Next Door, the St. Louis nuclear nightmare. Here are the basics. Mallinckrodt was a company in St. Louis where, during World War II, uranium was purified into a form that ultimately led to the creation of the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The highly radioactive weapons manufacturing waste materials created by this processing were first stockpiled in an uncovered dump at the St. Louis airport. Then, in 1973, between 43,000 and 48,000 tons of it was purchased as resource material by a company with a waste dump in North St. Louis, at that time pretty much out in the sticks, that's where the nuclear weapons waste was brought and illegally dumped into an unlined trench. In the 1980s, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission estimated that the radiologically impacted material was approximately 170,000 cubic tons, including 8,700 tons of leached barium sulfate and 39,000 tons of severely compromised material brought over from the site known as Latty Avenue. In the more than 40 years since the waste was transferred to the site we now know as the Westlake Landfill, a middle-class neighborhood grew up around it. The young families buying their homes knew nothing of the radioactive material in the area and that it had migrated off-site, contaminating the land in the area as well as Coldwater Creek, which runs into the Missouri River and from there to the Mississippi, source of drinking water for St. Louis and all communities downstream. For the last five years, an underground fire at the adjacent Bridgeton landfill has been working its way towards the buried rad waste. For three years, since the locals discovered the existence and implications of the Westlake nuclear waste dump, they have been fighting to have the government clean up these areas. Dr. Helen Caldicott is the Australian physician who has devoted the last 42 years to an international campaign to educate the public about the medical hazards of the nuclear age and the necessary changes in human behavior necessary to stop environmental destruction. She played a major role in reinvigorating Physicians for Social Responsibility 
and was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by Dr. Linus Pauling. Dr. Caldecott has been named as one of the most influential women of the 20th century. As you listen to this interview, recorded the day of the symposium in our hotel lobby, you'll understand why. You came all the way from Australia for the Adams Next Door event tonight. What made you decide to make the trip this far? Well, I am going on to Germany to speak in Germany, so it was on the way, but also I think it's terribly important to emphasize what is happening here and to publicize how wicked it is that people live near to big radioactive waste dumps that have been here virtually since the end of the Manhattan Project. We were on a van tour yesterday that took us to all of the major hot spots. Yeah. What impressed you or what angered you most about what you saw? Well, it just blew me away being a physician and a pediatrician that families with young children who are so sensitive to radiation are living adjacent to or quite near these radioactive waste dumps, which emit radon gas continually, which is a potent carcinogen, which emit radium-226 into the water, which is soluble and which gave Madame Curie cancer and her daughter cancer. It's a nasty, nasty element which is like calcium and concentrates in bones and causes bone cancer or leukemia and other elements such as those. And then to go and see that huge waste dump full of organochemicals and the most ghastly toxics the world's have ever, ever seen, xylene, benzene and the like, put there by Boeing and other huge companies. I thought it was just a waste dump with banana peels and household waste and there's a fire in it and I thought, why don't they dig it all up and put the fire out? But when I saw it, there's no way they can get into that. It's so extraordinarily toxic and there is a fire in there and there are also explosives buried with this toxic material as well. So I guess if they tried to get into it, something could explode and that is very close to and adjacent to the radioactive waste dump. And if that fire continues to burn and, and hits the radioactive waste dump, huge amounts of radioactive material will be expelled into the air like radon gas, which is classified here in this country as, as one of the most potent carcinogens known. And then someone told me that all the dogs in their street are getting cancer, even young dogs. Well, what happens to dogs happens to human beings. And children are 10 to 20 times more sensitive to radiation than adults. Little girls twice as sensitive as little boys. And there's a very high incidence of cancer around here but it seems that no decent epidemiological study has been done by the departments of health or whoever do it to find out what the real incidence of cancer is here and has been going way, way, way back. So it's, it's kind of an ignored community where people's lives don't seem to matter at all to the powers that be and they'd rather save money than remove this waste. You can't clean it up, but you can remove hundreds of thousands of tons of radioactive waste and take it somewhere in the desert and bury it deep beneath the earth from whence it came. And if they do that, then it's relatively safe. If America's going to spend a trillion dollars on building every single new nuclear weapon, submarine, ship, plane and missile in the next 30 years, for God's sake, for death, why don't they spend the money for life for their people's citizens and stop killing people overseas and look after the people here. For tonight's presentation, I've heard you say that you need a whiteboard in order to explain it. What's the nature of the information that you're going to be sharing with people? Well, I'm going to talk about the sort of radiation that's given off by these radioactive elements and the difference between gamma X-rays, gamma rays, alpha radiation and beta radiation and neutrons and what relevance that has to these particular elements in this radioactive waste. And then I'm going to explain how radiation induces cancer in a cell and what cancer is and just talk in general about the medical implications, the sort of cancers that can be incurred by these radioactive elements. So it will be a medical lecture teaching the audience the essence of medicine. 
I understand you also are in the process of making plans to address doctors and some of the teaching hospitals here in St. Louis. Tell us about that. Well, it occurred to me yesterday that the doctors have to get involved with this because this is a health issue, nothing else. And therefore, every hospital every week has what is called grand rounds. It's an hour taken out of their week where they all attend where they hear something about the brain or kidney function or whatever, the latest research, I would go and present the facts about the medical catastrophe that is happening here in St. Louis around these radioactive waste dumps and I guess teach the doctors what is happening because doctors wait till a patient comes into their consulting room with the cancer and we don't often get their occupational history where they live and what's happened to them during their life which could have incurred the cancer and we, we miss out on that. Therefore, it's imperative that we get the doctors to understand the cancers they're seeing. Many of them are related to this radioactive waste dump and then they'll do something about it. And doctors are so credible. I mean, when we had physicians for social responsibility, we led the discussion about the medical effects of nuclear war in the 80s. So therefore, we must get the doctors in this community totally involved in it. As a result of the presentation tonight by you, Bob Alvarez, and the others, what do you hope is going to be inspired or sparked in the people who attend and as word gets out? Well, I find that when people are really well educated about these issues, their soul becomes a light and they decide this is what they're going to do with their lives. And if they really love their children and grandchildren, they will have such a passion that nothing else matters and they will overturn every obstacle to get to the president if necessary, as we did with the nuclear weapons freeze and just virtually produce a kind of revolution because this is a democracy. People are obliged to vote as in Australia voting is compulsory and they don't deserve to live in a democracy unless they vote, but that's the beginning. They have to use the democracy. This is their country, and the people who are in Congress, they are their representatives, and the people are their leaders, particularly women. When they understand this issue, how dangerous this is for their children and their grandchildren, nothing stops them. Nothing stops them which of course we're seeing here because the entire movement is being sparked by the moms on yep. behalf of their children. Yep, of course. Dr. Helen Caldicott. I next spoke with Bob Alvarez, a senior scholar at the Institute for Policy Studies, where he is currently focused on nuclear disarmament, environmental and energy policies. At the U.S. Department of Energy, Bob served as a senior policy advisor to the Secretary and Deputy Assistant Secretary for National Security and the Environment from 1993 to 1999. He has written several studies on exactly what the people of North St. Louis are exposed to from the radioactive sites. What is it that brought you here to St. Louis for this symposium? Well, I was asked by the community college by uh, Wendy Vierhoff, if I might uh, come, and I said I would. And I've been following this for uh, a few years now and have a lot of empathy and support for the local activists. What are the most egregious errors that have been made with the Westlake Waste? It's an example of, I would say, gross government, a systematic failure particularly on the part of the United States government, to properly dispose of these wastes and to make sure that they don't continue to leave an area contaminated in a large, densely populated area. I mean, this what happened here was something that was in gross violation of the rules at the time, and the government through the Atomic Energy Commission did nothing about it. And it's sort of slipped through the bureaucratic cracks and it's gone on for over 40 years now and they should have never done it in the first place. When you say you've been covering this or following this very closely, what are some of the investigations you've done and reports that you have generated? Well, I wrote a uh, report in November of 2013 that sort of looked at the broader picture of how did this happen, what are the specific hazards involved and what has the government been doing about it. I then followed up with two of my colleagues, Marco Keltofen 
and Lucas Hickson, and we, in the last couple of years, collected several hundred soil and dust samples within a 75-square-mile area in proximity to the landfill and the other areas that were contaminated by these wastes just to see what has been happening and whether there's been any contamination drifting off-site from the landfill. And what we found was that... Uh, there is clear evidence of contaminants drifting off site from the landfill and also contamination that's being caused by hot spots that have not been cleaned up yet in these areas. The study that we did where we collected hundreds of samples over this 75 square mile area, one of the most important findings was that nearly all of the samples had the same characteristics as the waste that were processed at the Malacroft Patent House at St. Louis that were sitting outside in the open, were shipped around, and many of which were disposed at the landfill. So this is like a, a fingerprint yes. of the source of the waste. Yes. I mean, what we did was able to sort of do what you would call forensic research to determine where do the materials in these samples, what are they like and how do they compare to how they would exist in nature versus how they would be created by processing the uranium. And what we found is that they had all the characteristics of processed uranium. So the trail of breadcrumbs is clear. I think so. I think so. And it's really a, a problem of now political will and pressure and leadership on the part of the people who are representing the people of this area to make sure the job gets done. What are the implications for the people living nearby in North St. Louis, but beyond that, the people of St. Louis itself? This is a, a large population center. The landfill, in my opinion, represents the largest single hazard associated with this waste problem, and it was sort of conspicuous by its absence when the federal government finally moved to try to clean up some of the mess here. It's a mile and a half from the uh, Missouri River on a floodplain, and there are no engineered barriers to prevent this stuff from spreading into the ground or into the surrounding environment and ultimately going to the river. And these are wastes which actually become more and more radioactive over time, over thousands of years. How do they become more radioactive? I thought that they would decay. One of the principal contaminants in the landfill is an isotope called thorium-230, and it decays into radium-226, which actually is more radioactive. It's called radium ingrowth, and so there's a period of time that actually goes around 10,000 years where the radium ingrowth actually increases, and so radium has a half-life of about 1,260 years, I believe, whereas thorium has a half-life of 77,500 years. What happens as the radium accumulates and accumulates is that it too releases decay products in the form of radon gas, and then radon gas also decays into isotopes like lead-210, which then fall out from the gas into the environment. And so these levels of radioactive gases will go up by five, ten times over a period of many years. So these wastes should have never been allowed to sit around in the open as long as they were. They should have never been put into a, a landfill. I think it was patently illegal and in violation of federal standards at the time, and the government absolutely did nothing about it other than kick the can down the road. Now, if these wastes were located on the Hanford site, and they were close to the Columbia River and close to, let's say, the city of Richland, Washington, which is downstream from the Hanford site on the Columbia River, the, the removal of the waste from these landfills would be a first-order priority. But because the state of Missouri does not have a compliance agreement with the Department of Energy because these wastes that are sitting in a landfill were ostensibly transferred to a private party, they had no leverage to force the removal. And so what's happened is that the EPA inherited this problem. They don't have really all that much leverage over the private owners. And my opinion in doing research on this is that the EPA had made up its mind to leave these wastes there because they considered it too expensive to remove them well before they made their final decision. What are the chances that this can be remediated down to what we would consider a safe level? Well, I think that removal of these kinds of wastes is not unprecedented. I mean, the Corps of Engineers has been removing waste from burial grounds in other parts of the country, particularly in New York State and New Jersey. 
and they're about to do this in, in uh, western Pennsylvania. So it isn't like this is some impossible thing to do, but it, it will take time, and it will require very careful way, measures to do this. You just don't go in there with bulldozers and dig it up. You have to make sure there's safe containment to prevent the spread of the material as you dig it up, and, and you want to make sure your workers are being protected as you do it. What information are you planning to share with the audience at the symposium tonight? I was going to reiterate a, sort of a little bit of the history of how this problem came about and what we found in our study and what uh, is missing here, which is the need for the federal government to step in and to uh, assume responsibility because these wastes would not have occurred had it not been for the quest for nuclear weapons. They would have simply not existed and that the government engaged in such gross negligence in allowing these wastes to sit for decades on property at the St. Louis Airport and then sold them to some private party and moved them around through various suburbs of uh, St. Louis and contaminated all those areas and then let those piles sit there out in the open and then dispose of a great deal of it into a landfill in violation of the rules. And then then when it assumed regulatory responsibility, it just kicked a gander on the road and did nothing about it, and now it's advocating just leaving it there. That's just uh, an example of the government shirking its responsibility. And what do you hope is going to be the reaction, the response, and the after-actions of people who come tonight or listen to the program on live stream? Well, I can't predict how people respond to what I have to say. Uh, I'm hoping that they'll get a better grasp of the problem and also to have a better understanding of what some of the proposed solutions should be. And what can people do to agitate or support to get some of those solutions instituted? Well, I mean, right now the local community uh, activists have been successful in promoting legislation in the U.S. Congress, which has a good chance of passing, to transfer the management responsibility of these waste from the EPA to the U.S. Corps of Engineers, which I think is the first step in getting the government to step up to the plate and do its job. The next step should be for the government to assume actual responsibility for the waste and assume title of the waste and remove them in a proper way and contain the waste that they cannot remove in a proper way. Moving forward from this time, what do you anticipate your involvement and your work with your associates' involvement in Westlake? Well, we're doing some follow-up, and we'd like to sort of keep uh, an eye on this and do more uh, collection of data. We've been collecting some data after the floods to see what uh, impacts the floods might have had on this problem, and uh, we're still in the process of looking at that data and trying to understand it. And that will be another report coming out? In all likelihood, yes. Send a link. It'll be on the show. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bob. Bob Alvarez. We will have links up to the papers he mentioned on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 244. On Friday, February 21st, a press conference was held at St. Louis Community College, Wildwood. Dr. Caldecott held forth. I don't really have a concept in my mind yet. I've seen a few maps, but I have to see the places. But I was just told by Dawn, who lives next to Westlake, that she only found out three years ago that this stuff was next door to her and she's got three young children, 10 and under. I'm a pediatrician and children are extremely sensitive to the toxic and carcinogenic effects of radiation. This is obscene. I, I really can't get my mind around this as a physician. I, I don't know what the government thinks it's doing. It spends nearly a trillion dollars a year on weapons to kill people. Well, let's not kill people. Let's fix this situation. It should be dug up. The people should be removed from their houses because a hell of a lot of dust will be incurred and radon gas, which is extremely carcinogenic. This whole population should be moved and paid for and reimbursed for getting new houses because to sell a house here, you won't get much money because the houses aren't worth much because it's a very toxic area. This is a carcinogenic area. You know, in medicine, if you have a disease you can't cure, you must prevent it. We mostly can't cure cancer, and there's a 
series of photographs along here on this wall of children who've died of malignancies. It just breaks my heart and I, I can't, from a logical perspective, understand why the government hasn't done something about this. And for people to find out only three years ago that they're living next to a carcinogenic radioactive waste dump just blows my mind. That's not a very medical term either, but it does. So I'm here to investigate this, to find out more about it. So we're in a situation that must, I hate that word, remediation, fixed. And the only way to fix it is to take this damn stuff away to, I suppose, the desert. And the only way to fix it is to bury the uranium in the ground from whence it came. You can't put stuff over it. You've got to bury it deeply in the ground where it was before it was mined. And when it's in the ground, it's safe, relatively. And what really is extremely disturbing as well is that not only did people find out about this just three years ago, but there are no, I think, standardised health statistics or surveys that have been done of the health of the children and the people that live around here going back to 45. This is extraordinary. It's worse than most places I've ever been to. From there, we began our investigation with a van tour of all the radiologic sites. Van and driver donated courtesy the Teamsters Union. Included on board were Dr. Caldecott, Westlake Moms and Admins of the Westlake Landfill Facebook Info Hub, Don Chapman and Karen Nickel, Kay Dry, a revered Missouri environmentalist who has been fighting to protect the environment for over half a century, Byron DeLear, a local resident and longtime safe energy advocate currently running for Missouri State Assembly, and a film crew working on a documentary about Dr. Caldecott. Kay Dry first filled us in on the interconnectedness of the sites. Note that the sound is not optimal, but it gives you a sense of what it feels like to have that much anti-nuclear brain power in one noisy place at one time, looking at what it was we saw. Now, okay, so they found... Uranium and its daughters in Saintston Park. Was it quite concentrated there? What, how bad was it? The uranium that they dumped at the airport site that came from downtown, they had truckers driving it around the clock from downtown and they took it out to the 22 acre track next to the St. Louis airport and just dumped it there around the clock. And it's right next to Coldwater Creek. And then a company, a private company in Colorado, bought the materials that were dumped at the airport site, and they took it just about a mile away to a, another site called Laddie Avenue, and that also is on Coldwater Creek. It was also extremely contaminated. So it's just been moved from place to place. Coldwater Creek meanders through North St. Louis County. And unbelievably, after the Army Corps found radiological material there, they didn't even close the park down. And the community had to raise attention to the fact that this is ridiculous, that you've actually found nuclear waste at this park and you haven't shut it down? Kids can still go there? did not want it shut down because our kids played there. K. Dry proved an invaluable source of clear information, no matter how complex the sourcing was. And I turned to her repeatedly during the tour, taking advantage of our stops to gain better audio quality. They took the waste from the airport site and then they to Laddie Avenue just to dry them out, that's all, to make them weigh less so that they wouldn't have to pay as much to ship them to Colorado. So they contaminated, you know, Laddie Avenue, but also along this road and workers, truck drivers, and so forth. As we approach St. Sin Park, adjacent to Coldwater Creek. Karen Nickel told us what it was like to grow up in the area. Kids filled these parks daily when I was a child. I mean, it, there were a lot of young children in the neighborhood growing up uh, the same time I was, and, and it was back in a day where you didn't even have to have permission from your mom. You just, yeah, stay to the right, uh, left, to the left, to the left, to the left. This is the street that they are now finding radioactive waste in people's backyards. People's backyards. Huh? In people's backyards. Um, the closer we get to the creek down here, most of these houses have had water up to their main level of their homes from the flooding of the creek numerous times over the years. 
So as I understand it to be right now, there are six homes on this street that they have tested, and I think it's right in this area, that have known uh, nuclear weapons waste in their backyard. Karen Nickel. St. Sin Park is still an inviting, naturally beautiful piece of land adjacent to Coldwater Creek and is currently under remediation by the Army Corps of Engineers' FUSRAP program. Warning signs abound, and there's a fence around what looks to be half the site. That's where the cleanup is taking place. But the other side of the rubberized mesh fence is open, including a swing set and a slide. Dr. Caldecott had a lot to say about that. Area that's being remediated. But look, the there are still children's things here, here, and the children must still um, play there. The church. And the moms didn't want the park shut down to be cleaned up, because where are their kids yeah. going to play? It's okay, minority. the radiation stops right at the fence. Well, it's, it's not a solid fence. <laughs> <laughs> we'll post a picture of that park and that fence. And on a sign announcing the city of Hazelwood's park regulations, Dr. Caldecott graffitied in big, bold letters, this is radioactive land, four exclamation points. No dogs, no children, who are very sensitive to radiation. Signed by a physician. There's a picture of that on the website, too. As we met with a miniature contingent of mainstream media, Mary Osco came out of her house adjacent to the park to address them. What does living next to a radioactive dump do to a person's life, to their health? To improve on the sound quality, I interviewed Mary the next day, just before the symposium began, because I didn't want you to miss a word of what she had to say. My name is Mary Osco. Back in 1986, my husband and I bought a house, the last house, the end of a dead-end street next to a six-acre park. What an idyllic little place to raise our then two-year-old daughter. So we moved in. I was a stay-at-home mom. My husband was doing a lot of painting and cleaning and rehab on the house to get it ready for us to live there. So I started taking my daughter right next outside of our door to St. Sin Park. And I started walking in the park. And then after we got settled in and everything was uh, quieter, my husband would keep her at night. And I had my alone time down in the park walking lap after lap. I started meeting neighbors. I started getting to know people. I walked seven days a week. In June, it'll be 30 years that I've lived there. I started having some issues in maybe 2012, 2013 that I noticed. Other people said they noticed things that I complained about earlier than that, a couple years before that. But I just started having a lot of pain in my back. I started going to my primary care physician. And because I said I was a never smoker, we just went forward with testing for us pulled muscles. Is it cardiac issues? Do we have some kind of skeletal thing going on? So we kept getting treated with pain pills after pain pills, muscle relaxers. And two days before I was to finish and become a nurse, I couldn't take the pain anymore, and my husband ran me for the second time in two days to the ER. They did a CT scan of my thoracic region, which is your lung area, and they wheeled me back into the ER room, and one of the physicians came in. He said, we need to admit you up to the floor. You have lesions on your lung and your liver. Well, I knew what that meant. I had cancer. I slowly pivoted and looked at my husband and I said, I have cancer. And when they got me up to the room, you know, it was a progression of getting my IV started and our, our continued pain pills. I was on morphine. They did a PET scan. And I started being told the different stages of grief that I would go through, that it would be uh, pneumonia that would kill me, not the cancer. And this was before I even had a definitive diagnosis. They went in through my back and did a biopsy on that next Monday morning, released me to go home. And two days later, I was sitting on the couch. My mother-in-law and brother-in-law were visiting with me, and I got the call that said, Mary, you have adenocarcinoma. That means you're going to die. So it means I have a cancerous tumor of a glandular tissue. In my case, it was my lung. When we did our cancer unit when I was in nursing school, our instructor said, oh, I want to give you a big word, and I'll spell it for you. It's adenocarcinoma. If you ever have to be with your physician at the bedside of a patient and you give them this diagnosis, you are telling them they're going to die. When did you put it together that where you were living had something to do with your medical condition? We had heard through the years that there was dumping in the creek, but we thought it was from a car manufacturing plant, from an airplane manufacturing plant, and from the airport. There was fuels and things like that. I didn't know that it was radioactive waste. 
but about the time that I was diagnosed, it all started coming out more in the news. It was on Facebook a lot. Coldwater Creek, just the facts, was out there. And when I started reading about it, and I knew that it was in the creek by our house, I looked at my husband and I said, this is what's killing me. This is what I've been exposed to for 29 years. I've walked in that dust. I've walked in the dirt. I've inhaled it uh, since 1986 when we took possession of the house. And the house that we lived in for two years previous to that was about a half a mile as the crow flies from Westlake Landfill. Who got the atomic waste from Laddie Avenue storage site and they illegally went over and dumped it into an unlined landfill area? I was about two miles from that. Where I grew up in St. Anne was where Coldwater Creek can end. And there were some little tributaries that come off of it. And one of them, we believe, I'm not for sure on this yet, ran into a park that was up behind my house. I played in that creek growing up. So, three strikes, you're out. If that is the case, that I played in that creek which was coming off of Coldwater Creek, I'm not the one that you want, you want to have help you find a house because I'm going to find it next to radioactive waste. That means I've been exposed to it since I was one, you know, or old enough to go around and play in the park. I was diagnosed December 2013. I am considered stage four, which is a terminal diagnosis. Lung cancer, pancreatic cancers are the most difficult to treat. Lung cancer kills more women a year than the next three cancers combined, and yet we don't have a lot of funding. So that's a whole other story that we could talk about someday. So I've lived there. I've raised my children there. My children have multiple health issues, severe asthma as they were growing up, skin issues. My daughter now has some reproductive issues. My son has vomiting headache syndrome where he gets these migraines and he'll vomit out to where all the fluids are gone. We have to get him to the hospital. And they'll, put, they'll run like 2,000 cc bag you know, worth of fluids to get him rehydrated, and they'll give him medications. I put it together now, and it's like we're all sick. My husband hasn't really shown so many signs yet, but we have. But then we started going through all of our neighbors that have died of cancers. On the street behind me, at one point, and most of these people are gone and been replaced by the next generation, we counted 27 people that had been diagnosed, and we're very short blocks. There are not a lot of houses on our, the two little dead-end streets where I live that dead-end into St. Sin Park. So now we have the next generation of people that have moved in and bought these homes, not knowing because the owners sold them in good faith. They didn't know. As of three years ago, if I would have sold my house, I had assigned on the line, and I would not have known that anybody was moving next to radioactive waste from the Manhattan Project that was allowed to come out of rusty barrels that had been sitting up at the Laddie Avenue area that had big mounds of the salt byproduct that it rained on and it carried them down through the creek. And I'm really the first residential area that's there. So, you know, the park next to me, that six-acre park, had a lot of hot spots in it. And they've even found these hot or active spots in the yards on the street behind me. You know, we've worried about what's in the dust inside of our homes. What have we been exposed to? So we're part of the legacy of this, and it makes me feel angry. It makes me feel like another victim of World War II. We built the bomb to do a job. It ended the war. We went in and we stopped Japan. We obliterated, you know, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. But then we brought that, you know, we had all that extraction and those materials that we made those bombs out of, and we just dumped it in a site that was not a heavily populated area. But when it started to get to be a developed area, and it had a water source running right by it, nobody, nobody ever thought, we need to get that cleaned up, we need to get that contained, we need to get that shipped or put somewhere, look at all these people. They not only did that, but once it got in out on the creek, they would take some of that, the, the creek bank as they were rerouting it, and they would use it to fill where they were building all these big subdivisions. We had a lot of growth from the city out toward North County that with that northward expansion. If there was a low spot in front of the house, they filled it in with creek dirt. If you needed to build up in front of the homes to put in a sidewalk, they used it with creek dirt. And when they were transporting this dirt around, they did it in uncovered trucks. So now, can they go along the roads and find it? They're not convincing those of us that are citizens that are living in this area that they're going to be able to clean this all up. How far down did they go far down enough? Did they did it on a grid pattern? Did they get everything that's in between those spots? Did they get clean enough margins like you do with a tumor? How do we know that it hasn't metastasized like my cancer can and it's kind of migrated or moved to another area? You know, they've said they've done it, and when they got clean margins, that's where they could stop testing and stop cleaning. 
it doesn't give me the reassurance that I need to go back and walk in the park where I need to get my strength back from having lung surgery, from having chemotherapy, from being on these chemo drugs, which I will be on for the rest of my life, whatever time they can have left. I'll never have a cure as far as what I've been told on my cancer. That makes me angry. That makes me angry that I will never stand bad's bedside and I will never help another patient. Instead, I was the patient and I had a nurse taking care of me. It makes me angry I was one of the top students in my class and now some of my classmates may become my hospice nurse or be the one that will wipe my butt when I get to the point where I can't get out of bed. It makes me mad when my family sits around the table and my children are looking into my face and they wonder what I'm thinking about or maybe they don't. But I'm thinking about what have I exposed you to? My son, do you have my genes? Did you get that genetic material that's, that's mutated? I was pregnant 23 years ago. I've been there 30 years. Do the math. I was exposed to this during a pregnancy. And they're saying, well, who's most at risk are pregnant women and babies. I was a pregnant woman. I'm angry. I'm angry that so are my children going to be the next generation that will start filling up the cancer wards at Mercy and Barnes and St. Luke's and DePaul? You can go now to one of my appointments and you can barely find room to sit down. Cancer is rampant. I believe that it's because of the environmental waste and pollution that we have in our country. And I'm angry about that. I want this world to be cleaner than when I found the way I came in and found it. And, and it's not. And I feel like we have this small voice that's building in this city because we're mad. We are angry. We're going to go to Washington, D.C. We're going to talk to people that are on the local channels. We're going to talk to print journalists. We want our stories told. We're here. And, and we, we, we count. I was taking out of the job force as a nurse. I have a friend whose son was 28 died of lung cancer last year. He played ball on all those ball fields. He was married one year. He was taken out of his job and his profession and having a family. I have two or three other friends that were teachers. They're no longer in the classroom. We're losing a large population of people with gifts and talents to give to society because we're all at home on disability, trying to get out of bed enough to get to the bathroom, get a shower once a week, and get down to our oncology appointments so they can stick us with another needle, try to pry some more tissue out of us, and see if they can keep us alive just a little bit longer. And you know, sometimes you wonder if it's worth it because it's painful, it's debilitating, it's fatiguing, it's depressing. Mary Osco. We'll hear the concluding portion of this interview as today's final thought. Then we made our way to the Bridgeton Landfill. In a separate interview, Karen Nickel clued us in on what to expect. If you had never seen Bridgeton and Westlake Landfill with your own two eyes, you have no understanding of what this looks like. It looks like a monstrosity of pumps and hissing and, and the odor and the landfill is shrinking. You know, you go one day and you can tell settlement from the next day. It is a monster. It is really a monster that is taking people's lives. It's killing people. For a lot of the people that live around the Westlake area, Bridgeton and Maryland Heights, we know who our killer is. Photographs of the Bridgeton landfill cannot do it justice. I'd call it a desolate moonscape, except that would be to insult the moon. It is destroyed earth demolished, barren of any sign of genuine life, stretching as far as one can see behind a chain-link fence. No birds, no insects, nothing green except for massive tarps in astroturf green covering the burn area. Pipes vent underground gases that smell like they came straight from hell. Byron Delir and Dr. Caldecott start us off. Because they found radiation here, and ostensibly the radiation is thousands and thousands of feet away, yeah. the idea that it hasn't migrated into the area that's on fire is ridiculous. Is absolutely anyone tethered to common sense knows that that's an absolutely well, ridiculous nice assertion. The stuff that's coming out of here to see if it's radioactive. They will not perform a grid-like comprehensive test no, of the site. No, I don't mean grid-like. 
Have they tested what's coming out of here to see if there's radiation in it? I believe they've done some air tests. No, they... no, right at the no. exit of the gases. No. At that point, as if to prove how easily the radiation could migrate as gas or in the dust, the wind came up. But what they've done with the trees is really very impressive. Yeah, and the fact that it shows that yeah. this stuff is migrating in yeah. the groundwater, yeah. you know, that's what, the, because we're in the Missouri River floodplain, they'd be able to show that it was taken up by the trees. So it was very important. And Uranium-238. All the daughters of U-238 235. So yeah, that's coming up from the groundwater. Just hold the leachate, which is so hazardous that it has to be treated right there before it can even be sent to the treatment treat plant. It. And they had a lot of trouble bringing it online because the stuff was so caustic it was destroying the equipment. Yeah, Brand new design stuff was being destroyed. It, it wasn't operational for a long time because so. it was corroding. And what is currently known about the location of the fire at Bridgeton? They say maybe 800 feet away, 800 to 1,000. That's a moving number. They just... But what's also important to note is that if the radioactive waste has been there for 42 years, there's all the, the most high likelihood that it has migrated away from those original spaces that it's been at. So there's a very considerable chance that this waste is already being incinerated by the fire. On the way over to Westlake, we turned our attention to the agency purportedly in charge of the cleanup, the EPA. K Dry. EPA is doing nothing. The EPA's solution for Westlake landfill, when they found out about it, was to leave the waste there and put some rocks and construction rubble and a little bit of clay on top. And I have books about argillaceous materials. I had to learn that word. That's, there are many kinds of clays. And they didn't even dictate, you know, they just said some rock, some construction, and leave it. And the main thing about these wastes is that they're in the Missouri River floodplain. And the Missouri River floods all the time. And we even, at where this is located, there is a levee, but it's not a Corps of Engineers levee. Really important levees in our country are designed and built by the Army Corps of Engineers. This was just an, a farmer's levee initially. It was incredible farmland, 90 feet deep topsoil. Some of the best farmland in the world. And that's where they ended up, you know, that's where Westlake landfill is. Then we arrived at Westlake, which looked to all the world like a normal industrial construction company site. The parking lot where all these tractor trailer trucks are, that's area two right behind it where the trees are, and the radioactive material slumped into that parking lot. EPA did not clean it up. Republic Services actually asked to, for permission to clean it up. They were denied, and the owner of the trucking company went out with their own bulldozers and moved the material back across the property line, and there we have pictures of radioactive signs with bulldozer tracks where they drove around the signs to push the material back across their property line. When these trailers are parked, this, this is radioactive waste under the gravel. But all these trees up here, this is all surface level waste that's just been sitting here for 40 plus years. And you can oh. see the water runoff. Look at the water. I mean, it runs under the lot. It runs down here. It's very interesting to look at the birds and see their malformations and tumors and stuff. Which is what we saw is doing. The no. trees were EPA tested, and they EPA found the you know they, they found the same isotopes right. in the trees. They, did. they found they found uh, radioactive isotopes U two thirty five U two thirty eight thorium in all those trees. And radium. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they found. Well, they radium. found the daughters of U two thirty five. That was what was so yeah. important. It couldn't have been there unless it came from the Belgian Congo. Ditch right here. I mean, this thing floods. It comes directly from the site. This whole area right here fills up with water, and then it goes straight down into the Missouri so River. So people who own this rolling machinery with the big American flag, are they aware of it? I think they know. They make their money off of supplying equipment to the landfill. And they're told by the EPA that there's no immediate health risk. Immediate. 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 Right. Mm -hmm. immediate. Because it's, it's right. more emotionally satisfying to believe the EPA, they do so. Don and I before they put the second row up, walked around with a Geiger counter and Dawn, what, about three weeks later they put the second row? The <laughs> we think we were being surveilled and we got their attention. They didn't like us that close to it.
But see this second row here that's closer to the street? That wasn't there until after Dawn and I did a little bit of walking around. Right, like that small a distance is going to make a difference. Well, actually, it turns out that there are a couple of deposits of radioactivity between the two fence lines that they discovered since it's since they put the first one up. Right. It just, again, shows how inaccurate their testing has been. Those are radon and particulate monitors up there. Oh, okay. Byron, I might want to have a baby later. Close the door. <laughs> As we left Westlake, we passed signs directly across the street advertising homes for sale or rent. Dawn Chapman. The homes for sale or rent, yeah, moving poor people across the street from the nuclear dump. The next day, Saturday, February 20th, the symposium began with an art show and reception. I spoke with Kristen Camuso, whose photos graced the walls of the art exhibit, and have also graced Facebook and websites with pictures that capture a rare essence of who these people are and what they are going through. What led you to do the photos that you have done documenting this issue? Yeah, I joined the uh, Westlake Landfill Facebook group about three years ago, and I met a lot of people that were obviously sick, struggling with, with illnesses, some dying, some burying their children, and I realized that their stories weren't being told. We had the science, we had the history, but n the human side was just being forgotten. We ended up being a, a dot on a map or, or a statistic in a flawed health survey, and I, I felt that it, we needed to bring this. People needed to see the, the true face of this legacy, and that's what started the project. Humans of Westlake Landfill. However, after going to a FoosRap meeting uh, a few months into the project, I realized that I could not just tell the Westlake Landfill story. I needed to encompass the entire St. Louis region and St. Charles, and I've started taking some photos of some people from some other areas as well. Kristen Camuso. We'll have some of her photos and a link up on the website. Then I spoke with random strangers, asking them who they were and what brought them to the event. We went to listen to the keynote speakers mm -hmm. because our father worked out at the Weldon Springs site. Just would like to see the other things that are happening to people with um, no support. And hopefully they will get support now. That's what we're working towards. Christy Avery, I live in St. Anne, Missouri, which is also part of Bridgeton. I actually am a taxpayer to Bridgeton. I've been somewhat involved with the Westlake group, the Just Moms STL and other things. I'm on the CAG, which is the EPA Citizen Action Group. I've heard Helen Caldicott before. I'm very impressed with her work. I'm expecting her to both address the larger issue of nuclear proliferation and the health aspects of that since she has a, a medical background. I know Robert Alvarez is going to be here, and he has a lot of specific knowledge because he's written some of the independent papers on the Westlake landfill, and so I'm sure that will be brought into it as well. And I live three miles, about three miles from the landfill, and I work a half mile south from the landfill. I am Megan Beckerman. I have a sick child that I believe it's due to the landfill emissions from the underground fire. I am a supporting member of Just Moms STL, and we're just here to try to educate people on what's coming out of the landfill and what's still in the landfill. We need education. We've finally made the Washington Post. Everybody's hearing about it, but there's a lot to learn. My name is Ava Verhoff. I am five miles away. I live in Overland, Pine View Court, and I came here to talk to Denise Brock because I'm making a writing piece about her. And how old are you? I'm nine. Your name is? Reggie. And how old are you? Eight. And why are you here this evening other than your parents brought you? Mm, I don't know. What looked like over 300 people jammed the room to capacity. The live stream is posted on our website in its entirety, so you can get the information presented that evening, but it cannot convey the power, the pulse, the intense need to know the truth that permeated the atmosphere. Dr. Caldecott presented to a concentrated silence, broken only by occasional gasps. Bob Alvarez spoke on the exact nature of the buried waste and the government's legal responsibilities which are not being met. Denise Brock spoke of her work helping individuals seek compensation from the U.S. government 
as a result of their exposure to radiation and other toxic substances. I'll work on getting her for an interview in a future nuclear hot seat in order to give her important work its due. But for all the information that was shared, the audience was reduced to chills, tears, and intense concentration as Mary Osco stood and spoke from the heart. Time stood still, and we almost forgot to breathe at the power of the truth that she unleashed. As she ended, Kay Dry went to her to offer her a deeply supportive hug, and Dr. Caldecott called out from the stage, Get that woman on national television! If someone hearing this can help make that happen, email me at info at nuclear hot seat, and I will put you in touch with the right people. Then I set out into the audience to check with some people to find out how they felt about the evening. My name is Simone Wagner. I'll say it hit me really hard. I heard a little bit about this back in September of last year, but I didn't know that it was as bad as it was until I came to the event. Hearing everybody's stories, like, it almost broke me down inside because it's like people's lives are ruined. All the babies that were hurt. My grandparents lived near the airport, and now I have to go back home, and I have to explain to them everything that I heard. I didn't know that they were even going to do an evacuation or that it had been going on for that long, so it's definitely a hard one to take. My name is Lilton, Lilton Stewart. Before I actually got hired on to do this, this job, I knew nothing about this. Like I was totally oblivious to anything happening. I would drive through pass all the time and, and complain about the smell of the landfill over there. I knew nothing about the British landfill burning for over five years. That's the real reason why I even took the job to come out and do this, so I could kind of educate myself. And after being here with the, with the event, it just made me be like, I need to find out more and I need to see what we can do to make sure something happens. It blew my mind. I was, I'm disgusted but enlightened at the same time, you know what I mean? Yes, I do. Today's final thought belongs to Mary Osco. My show is downloaded regularly in 58 countries around the world on six continents. If you could say anything to those people to move them to take action, what would it be? This is not just a North County, St. Louis County, near St. Louis airport in the state of Missouri problem. There's not a place you can go in the 50 states that's safe. There's not a place you can go on any continent that's safe. Look at Chernobyl and how many countries that affected. If you look at how that cloud went up and how it dispersed itself over Europe and how these test clouds from New Mexico went up and dispersed themselves over states in the United States, we're safe. So no matter who's hearing my voice, in whatever country. If you think you're safe, if you're in a little Polynesian island somewhere, you're not. It can be in the air, and it can be, and as and I always sign my emails now, it's in the soil. We have got to start letting our federal governments and our legislators know we do not want to live in this polluted, dirty environment anymore. We want it cleaned up, we want it contained. And nuclear energy it shouldn't even be a consideration because there's a cost. We've got to look at something else. Where do you go with the storage of these products after they produce it? Once we mine it and get it out of those mines, you can't put it back the same way you got it. We're in a heap of trouble. Mary Osco. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, February 23rd, 2016. Thanks to Dr. Gwendolyn Verhoff for having conceived and produced The Atoms Next Door. My gratitude to all of you who contributed to help cover the cost of this trip, and my love, gratitude, and respect to all the residents of North St. Louis. This is Libby Halevi, who has been named by Don Chapman and Karen Nickel as an honorary mom of Westlake reminding you that we have all, all of us, had our nuclear wake-up call. Now do something!